In the 21st century, those who change the world are those who change the culture. They get people in sync, lead tribes, create movements, and generate an energy field where ordinary people achieve extraordinary results. We did some uh, work interviewing Paul Pullman. So Paul Pullman's the CEO of uh, Unilever. And um, as some of your particularly European listeners might know, right, Unilever is the large packaging company, right? So they've got ice creams like Wall ice cream and Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and they have Dove soap and Axe shampoo. And Paul Pullman set out a very uh, progressive sustainability plan that has to do with reducing their carbon footprint, that has to do with creating new uh, innovation to be able to to um, provide products to the bottom of the pyramid to improve their health and well-being. And when his managers come to him and say, you know, Paul, this is nice and good, but do you want me to manufacture in a cost-effective way or do you want me to manufacture in an environmentally sustainable way? His answer is yes, yes, right? And so that probably drives them absolutely crazy, but it forces them to really drill down to, okay, well, now we've raised the question. Yes, how do we do both? Let's develop new processes and practices to think about that. I'm Aga Weyer, and this is the Culture Lab podcast, where you will find ideas and inspiration on how to harness the power of team and organizational culture. I talk to leadership thinkers, culture experts, entrepreneurs, and all sorts of movers and shakers, and together we explore the fascinating topic of culture, leadership, and personal growth. If you like what you hear, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Or better yet, write a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your followers and friends on social media. For more, check out our archive at www.agabayer.com slash podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 25. So I just returned from the first Hacking HR Forum in Zurich. I was speaking about harnessing the power of culture in the 21st century. And there were other amazing speakers as well, really inspirational. Um, Hacking HR is a forum for collaboration, networking, and discussion about how HR and technology come together to create the future of people and work. It was founded in the US by Enrique Rubio and is really spreading across the globe with truly impressive speed. The Zurich chapter was organized by a lady called Nuria Rojo, and she's an incredible networker. She has fantastic passion for transforming HR and a very rare talent to connect people and ideas. I was truly blown away by her hospitality and warmth. She's a person that I met on LinkedIn and in real life, um, she's even better um, amazing hugger. She gave me this, this truly warm, amazing Spanish hug. Um, and the event itself, I was really blown away by the event as well because it had really superb turnout and such diversity. There were companies from startups to large corporations, Swiss and expat, and everyone came together to talk about the future of work and the future of HR. Um, so it was truly, truly incredible from 6 p.m. to some people say it until 11.30 p.m. Um, so I truly hope that there are more and more chapters in other countries because we definitely need those new fresh ideas in this field. There will be a video, by the way, from the event. Uh, it will be made available soon, so you can check it out on the Hacking HR Forum YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel as well. Um, so now let's move to this week's episode, and my guest is Wendy Smith. Wendy researches a really interesting area, strategic paradoxes. And thanks to her and to her work, I've become much more aware of how deep is the conditioning to create false dilemmas in our lives. For example, do I go for a walk or do I do some more work? Do I focus on the social impact of my work or on profitability? Have a listen. I'm sure you will enjoy this episode. Welcome to Culture Lab, Wendy. Aga, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. 
thank you for coming on. And I'm so thrilled to you have a very, very interesting area that you focus on. So I can't wait to talk to you about this. So would you like to tell our listeners just a few words about you and your work? Absolutely. I uh, am a PhD in organizational behavior, and I started the PhD interested in exploring issues of social responsibility, how organizations manage social missions along with financial pressures. I then started exploring how organizations manage their existing businesses along with uh, innovating new ideas. And these pieces came together around the idea of really negotiating these competing demands at the strategic level. And this is what introduced me to the notion of paradox, which I am sure we'll get into in more depth. Absolutely. So before we go that, I want us to rewind a little bit and ask you about the early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. So in other words, what made Wendy, Wendy? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, in part, as I think back through my childhood, I was somewhat of a third culture kid. Um, I know there's a lot of work on third culture kids that really move from their home culture to a new culture where there's a different language, a totally different culture, mm -hmm. and then are negotiating those two spaces. My move wasn't so dramatic. I moved from Canada when I was really young amidst the political strife between Francophones and Anglophones, and we moved to the United States, to South Florida. And while mm -hmm. the language wasn't so different, the, the culture was similar enough. It really felt like we were in exile, if you will. Uh, I remember growing up in Florida, and I, I distinctly remember doing a unit when I was in primary school on the history of Florida and thinking this was as foreign to me from an identity perspective, from an identification perspective, as when I was doing a unit on Pompeii or on the British royal yeah. family or whatever other historical places that were just somewhat foreign. It wasn't my home. But then I would go back to Canada and we would go back yearly and that wasn't fully my home either. And in some ways, if you look at the research on third culture kids, there's this like bifurcation. Some kids really flourish in this experience of being in multiple places where it expands their worldview. And some people really feel that sense of placelessness. They don't belong. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways, it, it, for me, it really gave me the sense of expansion where I could be multiple things, multiple places. There was really different ways that people lived, that they engaged in the world. And I think perhaps for me, that's what gave me a lot of curiosity about different cultures, a lot of uh, interest in travel, a lot of interest in different places, but also this cognitive sense of being that there's something broader out there. And maybe that sort of breath is what influenced a bit of uh, the, the things that I study, the notion of paradox, the, you know, the idea of place and placelessness and, and boundedness and unboundedness and, and their relationships uh, might, might be influenced a bit by that experience. Absolutely. I, I, it makes complete sense to me because you say on one hand you belong, on one hand you don't belong, it's home, but on the other hand it's not home. Um, and the focus of your work today is paradox. Um, so I'm curious, uh, when was the first time you stumbled upon paradox and when when did you become interested in that notion? Yeah, it's a great question. I um, uh, So the this, I think the background, much of this came together in grad school when I was in my PhD program. Um, personally, I was grappling with multiple debates. Do I become a consultant out there that works with really practical problems or a, either a consultant or a practitioner with really get my hands dirty and practical problems? Or do I become an academic that's studying these things and not really engaged with them? And uh, do I, when I started grad school, do I study social responsibility? which was really hot and focused at that time. I started right after Enron had just crashed and there was just a number of real ethical dilemmas. Or do I study innovation and change because there was real work to be done there? And I was really stuck personally in these sort of either or debates. Um, mm -hmm. And at the same time, 
uh, I was engaged in this research project around change uh, at IBM. And so um, uh, just by, by way of a bit of background, um, IBM had, I was starting in the late 1990s. And in the early 1990s, you, some of your listeners might remember, IBM had a massive market crash. They lost about $5 billion because they were really focused on the mainframe business and they couldn't transition quickly enough to the personal computing business and uh, semiconductors were getting faster, but being developed over in Japan. They just, it was a real sort of confluence of events that prevented them from succeeding. And they, they almost, they almost uh, died as an organization. And it, it was such a, a massive crash. They had laid off about half of their workforce at the time. In 99, uh, so they, they really turned around. They brought in Lou Gerstner. They turned around. And I started doing research in 99, several years later, when they had transitioned to doing uh, more personal computing, client server work, not mainframe work. But then they saw the internet wave coming, this, this whole new transition to what we now know as cloud-based computing and web-based computing. And at that time, they said, you know, how do we manage this technological revolution without having this near-death experience that we did several years before. And at the time, uh, there was work on change. Some of your listeners might remember Collins and Porus, good to great, built to last. And the idea of many of the change uh, theorist was in order to manage change, you have to go from where you've been to where you're going quickly. You have to define a new strategy. And then, and the language was you have to get people on the bus to go there. And if people aren't getting on the bus, they just have to move aside, like rip the bandaid, go quickly. But what, um, what we realized, and actually what my advisor, I was working with uh, Mike Tushman at uh, Harvard Business School, and what he and his colleagues had been working on was this idea that, you know, having observed organizations for and, and change and innovation in organizations, that's not exactly the case. It's not exactly the case that we just dump and get rid of everything in the past uh, and then just move to the new future. Rather, we hold on to that existing world for quite some time. It's a slow transition. So even if IBM is going to move to the cloud-based world, they're not just going to give up the millions of dollars and the millions of existing customers that they have and clients that they have in their existing world. So it's not a world where the question is, how do we move to the future quickly? It's a world where the question is, how do we move to the future quickly while at the same time managing the current world? It was a different question. And so uh, Mike Tushman with his colleague, Charles O'Reilly, had started to talk about this idea of being an ambidextrous organization, having to have one hand focused on the, the current world and one hand focused on the new world simultaneously. And in, in that world, I was studying these teams at IBM trying to do that. And the question was, how can the senior leadership of, and this was the, the strategic business units at IBM, how can they effectively lead around this mandate to do these two things? When the existing world was a very different set of metrics, it was short term, it was current market focused, it was you know very operational focused, you can't fail. And at the same time, trying to innovate where it was really long-term return on, on investment and you had to fail, but you had to fail quickly and learn and experiment. It was a, a whole different different skills, different types of coding of uh, for yeah. their engineers, different skills for their engineers. So how could they, they do both? And that was the question that I started to study uh, with these senior leaders. It's fascinating. And I think we all know that leaders today, just like back then, face a lot of contradictory challenges very often. And as you say, it might, it might be being under pressure to improve the existing products and at the same time to invent radically. Um, and often I think what happens is that leaders feel forced to prioritize one over the other. Or if they decide to pursue both, as you said, sometimes they will decide on trade-offs that have to be made. And I think knowing your work a little bit, you believe that it definitely doesn't have to be this way. And you suggest a new leadership model where the goal of leadership is to maintain something that you call a dynamic equilibrium. 
right? And it seems to be quite a difficult notion to grasp, um, I feel. So is there a way for us to describe it in simple terms? Yeah, absolutely. So this is where we position the idea of a paradoxical mindset or a both-and mindset in contrast to this notion of an either-or or a trade-off. So instead of saying, do we focus on the past or focus on the future, which by the way, some of the senior teams do or, do, you know, that I see that's, that's where we tend to go, which is which one of these do we choose? Which one do we prioritize? This paradoxical mindset, this both and mindset asks, how do we do both simultaneously? How can we both explore and exploit? And as you said, this is something that really the, the mindset I started thinking about it in terms of this context of innovation and change, but we could think about it in terms of the context of social mission and financial demands. You know, many organizations, do we focus on a social mission or, are we, you know, are we financially driven? Are we for-profit or non-profit? You know, our organizations today, are we a global organization that has this universal culture or are we local where we honor and respect that which is unique and distinct in each of these local places? Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, how do we think about those kind of strategic, you know, we can think about it in our own lives. Like for me, it was, am I practice focused or academic focused? Am I focused on work or am I focused on my life more broadly? Am I focused on pleasing my current clients or developing new ideas for new clients? It's this sense of trade-off is really embedded in our, our minds. And like you said, the work that we're doing is to unpack, well, what does it look like if we start by just changing the question and ask, how do we do both? Right. So I wonder what do leaders need in terms of skills or mindset to do uh, both simultaneously? Because it definitely sounds like quite a difficult task. We do seem to be hardwired um, for choices. Um, so what do you need to be able to do this well? And um, then how do you develop it, I suppose? Yeah. And I think that what you need to do it well, the first is how the leaders think about these ideas uh, and then help others think about them. And as well, how they manage to create structures and processes on their team. So when it comes to thinking about these kind of issues, the first is that we see some really amazing leaders who, you know, very simply adopt what we call a both and mindset. And so, so what does that mean? It means that when I face these either ors, the first gut reaction I have is to say, how can I do the both and, you know, and, and just changing mm -hmm. the question. There was a, um, a psychiatrist, Watzlawick, and he once said, the problem is not the problem. The problem is how we think about the problem. So yeah. what if we just change the question and stop asking, which do I prioritize? Am I innovation focused or existing product focused? Am I nonprofit or for profit? And ask, how can I accommodate both of these things simultaneously? Right. Instead of me asking, mm -hmm. am I a practitioner consultant or am I an academic? I, you know, the change of question is how can I engage in research that's pra that's impactful? How can I engage, mm -hmm. you know, in these dual practices simultaneously? What would that look like? So in some ways, the first piece is simply asking a new question. Right. And I think I just want to underscore that because it's one of the themes actually that um, comes out of all these interviews where a lot of guests talk about the importance of asking better questions. Um, and it's so true. We always need to challenge our assumptions because if we ask the question, do I do this or do I do that? So the assumption behind that is that you cannot do both, as you say, at the same time. That's right. Um, so asking better questions is step number one. What, what else can That's right. you do? That's right. So when it comes to thinking about this, what our research has shown, so we have, um, we, we developed what we called a paradox mindset measure. And, and the first piece is, uh, are people aware of the tensions? And so are they acknowledging the tensions? Some people are just willing to avoid them. And then do they have the capabilities to emotionally engage with these tensions? So what we know from research is that one of the reasons that we ask an either or question is because asking a both and question can lead to a ton of uncertainty. It's really, we're really uncomfortable with uncertainty in the world. We just don't want to deal with it. We want clarity. We want specificity, particularly if we're dealing with other people, we need to be clear for them and specific for them and either ors make a decision and are much more specific than let's leave things open to a both and. Um, so are we willing to live in that 
uncertainty, that that discomfort and the ambiguity. Um, and then the other piece is uh, how we structure our thinking around it. And so we talk about the processes, these sort of dual processes, so maybe paradoxical processes to manage paradox that has to do with both pulling apart the options and bringing them together. So we talk about separating and connecting or differentiating and integrating. The pulling apart is you really need to understand what each of your alternative options look like. You have to drill down and get some specificity first and then you have to be able to find the synergies, linkages, places where they connect. So, you know, what does that look like? If, if I'm going to unpack my own decisions about being an academic or being a practitioner, well, if I just leave it at that, then I have to make a choice about what job I'm going to have, what career I'm going to have. But if I unpack what it is that I'm excited about in the world of practice, where I'm excited about impacting people's worlds and making a difference in the world and really connecting with people. And I'm excited about what it is about academia. I'm excited about new ideas. I'm excited about teaching those new ideas. I'm excited about uh, research researching those new ideas. Then I can unpack what each of these are about and find deeper linkages between them. And so in the world of of, of leaders that have to deal with these kinds of tensions like the existing world, innovation world tension, the question is what is what do we know about the existing world? What resources, what skills, what reward system, what goals? And what do we know about the innovative world, the resources? And how are they different from one another? Let's just not mush them into one you know, overall general leadership, let's pull them apart and then let's find the really specific linkages, ways that they connect with one another. And so this notion of pulling apart and bringing together is a way to deal with, to cognitively work through these paradoxes. And in, in some ways we can contrast it with this either or trade-off thinking. What we tend to do is we tend to pull things apart, find the ways they're different and then choose. It's like make the big pro con list or analyze and then come to a decision and choose. Whereas this sort of separating and integrating, I, I think the third piece about it is leaving the choice to be a little more dynamic. You had asked earlier about this dynamic equilibrium idea that we, we suggest. Um, you know, one of the things that we know about paradox is that um, – it's not about making a choice, sticking with it, and, and being stuck in that choice. We like to say it's about choosing. So what does that mean? It means, it means that uh, you know, if, I'm, if I'm in the world of trying to negotiate work-life demands, and this is the world where we do this all the time, Sometimes I'm focused on what life demands of me, my family, my you know, uh, hobbies, life outside of work. And sometimes those things have to be put on hold to focus on what work demands of me. But I'm not making an overall choice that it's just one or the other. I'm sort of fluidly moving between them. And uh, so the metaphor that we sometimes use for this is uh, thinking about a tightrope walker, right? In order for a tightrope walker to go straight and to stay focused, they are constantly in this dynamic balancing between left and right. Or, you know, those not everyone's walked the tightrope. We could think about riding a bicycle, right? Like to go forward, you're constantly in this sort of nuanced, dynamic balancing. But it's not these like massive shifts from one to the other. It's these sort of micro shifts that allow you to hold on to both ideas at the same time. Right, so I'll just say one more thing, just by way of example. What I what I saw at IBM, for example, and this is partially where this idea came from, was that the top, the general managers that were able to effectively manage this explore exploit world, or the existing world and the innovative world, were not making these like massive decisions in which both of these things they were allocating resources where both of these things came into like some you know, integrative, beautiful solution, but they were constantly shifting resources, structures back and forth so that they could sometimes reinforce and bolster their existing world and sometimes reinforce and bolster their innovative world. Yeah. So let me ask you a question about this, just to make it super, super clear for our listeners, perhaps giving an example from our everyday lives where we can really understand how, how this can play out. So when you talk about this continuous movement, uh, like walking on a tightrope, so let's say that someone has this dilemma, do I focus on my family? And I think this is definitely a very 
common question that a lot of women still ask themselves today. Do I focus on uh, my family and my kids or do I focus on my career? Um, which is a false dilemma, as you say, because you can combine both. So what would that dynamic equilibrium look like practically for a woman who doesn't make a choice, but decides to do both? That's right. And the family career debate, I think, is a great example. You know, in some ways, we've set this up as a dichotomy, and particularly for women. But, you know, as as your listeners might resonate, for men, too, this definitely creates some tensions yeah. there. And, um, you know, I remember when I first had my kids and there was a real debate among my, you know, my friends and colleagues about who would basically focus on career and figure out ways to have their kids attended to and who would focus on on their family and walk away from their careers. And in some cases, those are really difficult choices. Mm -hmm. And it, those really feel like the either or approach saying that when it comes down to it, we can't do both. Um, and indeed, it's hard to really navigate these tensions. The paradoxical approach might say, okay, how can I navigate both of these simultaneously? And what does that look like? Now, you know, in some ways, people think of paradox and they think that there's a solution. There's this like ideal creative integration, sort of like the Hegelian synthesis. And sometimes there is, but, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. there's not always that ideal. What I'm going to do is open up a daycare so that my kids can be in the daycare. They're at my work. I'm being their parent. Like that's mm -hmm. lovely, but is, is rare. So what it what often happens is that what we are doing mm -hmm. is being much more fluid in how we allocate our resources, in particular in this case, time, where we are finding ways in which we are shifting back and forth in these smaller increments to be able to both attend to our our career and attend to our our family and really navigate between them in terms of how we allocate our time. You know, I, I will say my experience is that oftentimes what stands in the way is our identities because we get caught up in, am I a career person or am I a family person without giving ourselves the space to say, you know what, I'm actually doing both and that's okay. Yeah, I think identity definitely plays a huge role in our lives, in our personal lives, and of course at the work as well, because even thinking about a corporation, um, a lot of companies or company cultures um, identify with innovation. And then I suppose it's easier to be adaptable and innovative. Um, but other organizations identify with tradition or heritage. Um, and then it, it can be, it may be more difficult or reliability, whatever it is, it may be more difficult than to embrace um those activities that will lead to them reinventing themselves. That's right. And the question for these companies is how can you construct an identity? We sometimes talk about it as an overarching vision, a sort of global vision and a, a sort of superordinate vision that encompasses both and motivates people to say we're both, right? So sometimes we look um, mm -hmm. at an example of Lego. Uh, Lego had a real challenge around being either too focused on who they, their, their existing world. For many, many years, they were very committed to the Lego brick. This is what we do. They almost got killed when the whole toy industry was overtaken by electronics. Uh, and then yeah. Lego's response, because they, they really wanted to be an innovative company, was to swing almost, you know, 180 in the opposite direction and do every kind of innovative protocols. It was like textbook innovation, but every single one of them. And that's when they had open source innovation and they started doing new, you know, new products and they started to uh, brand with other things like Star Wars and Barbies. And that's when they opened up Legoland. But they were so innovative that they, that's where they almost were killed. They, they had no discipline around their innovation. And so at some point they had to come back to yeah. how do we think about mm -hmm. innovating, but with some simple rules that create boundaries. So we're not innovating wildly. We're not just super innovative, but we are innovative within boundaries so that we have some discipline and operational excellence around our innovation. So how do we live in between these sort of focused rules and wild innovation culture. And 
it was then they, they started taking on this. They had, their vision today is building mm-hmm. the builders of tomorrow. It's this very inspiring vision statement. It has within it the notion of building for today and building for tomorrow. And so I think this point about identity is really important. And one of the keys is helping organizations move up a level in their identity so that they're not just narrowly focused on we're an innovative company, but we are a company that can accomplish innovation even amidst the operational discipline. Yes, yes, that's that's extremely important. So hypothetical scenario, if you are a leader in an organization and you want to cultivate a culture that supports that sort of mindset, what what sort of things do you need to have in place? Yeah, it's a great question. And for years, uh, I would facilitate workshops or give keynotes around this notion of how leaders could make themselves more paradoxical in their own thinking. And this question mm-hmm. came up again and again, how do you create these conditions for others? Um, we did some work at, at uh, W.L. Gore, the product manufacturing the uh, company, and they have some real focus in their organization on what they call managing polarities. They talk about it as breathing in and breathing out. And, or, or they, what they say is that we've got to do both. We've got to breathe in and breathe out. We've got to do both. We've got to be hyper local and small teams, small wins and super global and enterprise level. And the question for them was, how do they get people to get this? And so I know Mm. I had seen uh, a a wonderful piece that you had posted on the importance of storytelling. Uh, And Mm. I would resonate with that because one thing that we are learning is that these ideas of how to navigate paradox are really complex. And the question is, how do we get people to get their head around it from the place that they are. And what we're learning is that stories, metaphors, uh, ideas that are really evocative and full of imagery and full of uh, nuance help people understand that because it lets people into these complex ideas at the place that they Mm -hmm. are. Yes. And it makes it uh, more digestible and easier to understand as well, because I think those, as you say, really complex notions. Um, So it's easier to understand. And it's also then definitely easier to embrace and embody those things when those messages are conveyed as a story, particularly I, I feel when the story comes from our own environment where you can say, ah, okay, so my colleagues have done this and had a positive outcome because then um, it's sort of a social proof that it's possible within our context as well. That's right. And it lets people to feel more vulnerable. It lets people feel more uh, connected mm-hmm. because we're not sort of lonely in our own challenges and problems of the world. We realize actually everybody's dealing with these kinds of tensions. It's not just me. Right. Uh, and, and these stories really stick with us. They're much stickier than just telling people yeah. you got to believe in the both and, or you got to live in these contradictory, these interdependent contradictions. Those words sort of fly over people's heads, but telling them a story of how leaders really grow grappled with these tensions. Mm. That's where it, you know, and leaders, like you said, in your own organization. Yeah. So speaking of stories of how leaders grappled with those things, do you have a story to share with our listeners of an organization that you've either worked with or, or researched that um, had really impressive success uh, with embracing the paradoxical mindset and the um, both and leadership? Yeah, great question. Uh, as I said earlier, some of the my early work was really looking at this notion of innovation and change, and I then uh, have shifted to focusing on this context of social impact, social innovation, both within companies and um, in social entrepreneurships. And uh, I have been working with one company, or working with a couple of companies that are doing this kind of social impact work. One of them is uh, Digital Divide Data, which is an organization that's now in its 19th year and started in Cambodia as an IT um, uh, labor, inten- they call themselves a labor intensive uh, provider where they do data entry work and they do digitization work of analog of existing work. And 
but their goal is really to employ the most disadvantaged people in the country. And so Cambodia is pretty disadvantaged. There's a lot of people there that can't get work. Uh, there was a lot of programs to do job training, but those job training programs were great. There were just no jobs at the end of them. Mm -hmm. So this was an organization, Jeremy Hockenstein, their CEO said, what if we created a business that uh, did this digitization work? It was being done all over India, all over China at the time. But what if we do this in Cambodia, where we do it in the service of bringing in the most disadvantaged people in Cambodia? So these are people who were physically disabled in some way. And there was a culture that was really, um, that, that was really, uh, uh, not, uh, hiring people who are physically disabled. It was people who, women who were rescued from sex trafficking. It was people who lived in very rural communities in Cambodia. What if we hire them, provide them with jobs, but then with a significant amount of on the job training so that they could really develop their skills and move on to better jobs, even better than we're able to provide. Mm -hmm. And so Digital Divide Data has been doing this now with over 2,000 employees in four different countries wow. and has been uh, has graduated over 1,000 people moving on to jobs that are like six to eight times the national average in salary. And a key to wow, being able to do this was Jeremy as the CEO, as well as his team, really consistently putting front and center this tension between their social mission to stop the cycle of poverty in those countries, to provide resources, skills, work, jobs to this population so that they can really enable support for themselves, while at the same time, they had to provide and be a competitive, they had to be competitive in this very commoditized business of, of IT data entry. Mm -hmm. And they talk about it as bowing before dual gods. And they, they're they really clear that if they were just a nonprofit providing job training, that would be very focused, very clear. If they were just a for-profit providing uh you know, data entry, then they would be competing against all of these companies in India, but they're not. They're really trying to navigate both of these. And what it means is that they are constantly in the discussion and debate about how they manage and support both of these goals. And they're very clear. It's two distinct goals. We, we sort of describe it as they have clear guardrails to make sure that they're not going out of bounds of being too business focused or being too social mission focused. But then they have a lot of this notion we were talking earlier about this dynamic equilibrium, mm -hmm. a lot of moving back and forth and how they make sure they accomplish both of these goals simultaneously. So, so trying to become slightly more granular with this to understand how they have achieved that. And you talked about separation in the early stages. Um, so I'm just curious, how did they do that? How did they arrive at a level of clarity where they felt, okay, we can do this? Um, was there a unit that started thinking about what will be the angle, our angle on the social impact that we can have? And then um, the business development unit that just looked at the financial and then they came together. Do you know what process they used? Yes. That's right. So initially when they were a small entrepreneurial organization, it wasn't a unit, but it was specific people who tended mm -hmm. to take on the role of being more focused on the mission. And so this tended to be, for example, the HR vice president. She was the one who was trying to figure out who to hire amongst these very disadvantaged groups. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, somebody who was more focused on um, the, the operational sustainability, making sure that they were addressing their client needs, that they were responding effectively and quickly, that they were getting out work as productively as possible at the managerial level. And then so too, when they built their board, they were really clear that everybody, so, so, well, let me just say in terms of separating, they had some people who came from business and had run million dollar businesses and that they wanted their help to figure out how to be business savvy. And then there were some mm -hmm. people who came from development work with their, and, and from the IMF and from who really knew and understood the development aspect as far as their mm -hmm. employees. So part of it was people took on different yeah. roles. Another mm -hmm. part, you know, for example, is that there was a point where even as they had 
integrated uh, accounts, they had two sets of P&L statements so that they could look at real drivers of their financial sustainability and separate that from drivers of their social mission. So they understood which were being driven by which different levers and could then manage each of these separately. Now, that said, Mm. they then had to bring it all back together. And so one critical piece was even as these leaders, for example, took on these roles in some way of being more financially focused or more socially focused, they also had to take on a role of understanding that they were there to navigate and to uphold both missions. And so this this is where we talk about this paradoxical mindset, this paradoxical frame. Mm. They all had to bow before dual gods. And actually, it was so critical that they were able to both hold their specific role and at the same time see the big picture that there were a couple of people over the course of time in the organization that got too focused on one mission. And in particular, too focused on the business mission that they were they, they were encouraging, uh, emphasizing the business mission, prioritizing it over mm-hmm. the social mission to such an extent that the organization had to say, thank you very much, but that's not where we're going mm-hmm. and had to ask these people to leave, both at a managerial level and a board level. And it really yeah. emphasizes the importance of who the people are on your team. Do they get it? Are they willing to hold both their roles, their specific roles, and then manage across both of these? Because there's a lot of conflict there. They have to learn to live and navigate through that conflict that happens. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. I don't know why, but I, as you were speaking about what was going on there, uh, an image that I got in front of my eyes was um, an orchestra where basically everyone has their own role in the orchestra. They support the the, the um, symphony or whatever they are playing. Um, and sometimes it can happen that someone will try to do a solo where they shouldn't. And I wonder, was it the same process as in the orchestra where this happens? Was it the role of the director? So my understanding would be the CEO to bring the balance back, uh, bring, bring the equilibrium back. How did they deal with that? So those guys, you said they were fired. Um, but generally, on everyday basis, how who was um, responsible, let's say, or who was the guardian of the equilibrium in that in that organization? That's right. I, you know, this goes back to the notion of it's really the leader's job to navigate the culture, and if we're going to have a culture of of holding these paradoxical tensions, if somebody's really out of bounds of that culture, if somebody is so far emphasizing just one of these poles, if you will, or one of these goals, strategic missions, or what have you, and creating conflict, it's really the the leader who has to be able to manage that. And one of the things that we found, you know, and sometimes, you know, we talked about getting people on or off the bus. Here, the bus is a bus where it says, look, we're on board with this, you know, this strategic mission, the strategic uh, goal of doing both of these things. And if you can't be on that bus of doing both of these things, this is not the right bus for you. And actually, it's a really good point because one of the things that we find that, that makes this so difficult for leaders, I mean, I've worked with so many companies where this really breaks down. And one of the reasons it's so hard is, is, um, there is a lot of conflict. And so you have to be open to working through that conflict and, and see it as a valuable conversation. And leaders are afraid to get rid of the the team players that aren't on the bus in that way. And sometimes we just let those people live Mm -hmm. for too long uh, and and they infect the rest of the culture. It just creates too much detrimental tension, detrimental conflict. Yes. And yeah, and I imagine it's really not easy. And, you know, while this organization had quite a unique or maybe not very common mission let's let's call it like this but i think most of the organizations now they have uh, their csr agenda so the impact social impact is really important for most organizations nowadays and definitely the people aspect of the business is very important for all organizations. So those conflicts and that tension, I think, is present in every single company that I personally know. And I can Im- only imagine that generally it would be present in all the organizations. That's right. So uh, in some ways, if people like to, you know, if misery likes company, everybody's experiencing these tensions. Yeah. <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> uh, the question yeah. is how you're dealing with them. So our point of view is that these tensions 
tensions exist in a company. And it's a question of, number one, how salient are they for people? So even organizations that might not have a CSR agenda have to worry about their impact on a broader set of stakeholders beyond their you know, their, their narrow shareholders. And, you know, in some ways, uh, as a business school professor, Enron was one of the greatest things to happen to point to, look what happens if profit becomes God. And it's mm-hmm. the only thing we yeah. focus on. And we don't offset that with any concern for a broader sense of uh, stakeholders or for a broader ethical agenda or whatever it might be. That's where we end up. Mm-hmm. Um and in the extreme. And so these these tensions always exist. We all live with them. And the question is, how can we navigate them better or worse? And our argument is that by raising them to the surface, leaders that can bring them to the surface and that can help uh, people walk through these tensions and live with them do a better job of doing so. But again, that's that's really hard to do. And as you mentioned, when I asked you what skills are required, um, and you alluded to, to this right now, number one thing to do is to be aware of that, be aware of those tensions, and then bring them to the surface, as you say, and, and start talking about those things openly, um, I suppose, right? So when you- That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And, you know, in some ways, um, uh, we've worked with leaders where they say, look, again, it goes back to your earlier point. Here is a tension. We have to make a decision. You know, and, and we in business schools are probably the most guilty of this. We, mm-hmm. we, we, as professors, we give our students cases and the case always ends with some kind of like, do we, does the leader do A or B? Right. And our goal is to teach the students how to make a better decision Mm -hmm. in those situations. Rarely do we give them cases and say, does the leader do A or B and say, how can leaders do both? Mm -hmm. How can they accommodate both? And so we teach leaders, they have to be consistent. They have to be clear. They have to be focused. They have to pick a choice, but that's not the case in a world where there's so much. I mean, we live in this world that is so much more uncertain, so much more complex, so much more um, Mm -hmm. dynamic where things are changing so quickly that Mm -hmm. these A or B choices have become so much more, um, uh, they, they, these tensions come to the surface more and being able to make a choice and really stick with it is no longer really uh, available to a leader, to a CEO. You know, um, uh, we have colleagues at Oxford who did a really great uh, piece with Heinrich and Struggles, the, uh, the search firm. And they interviewed CEOs from around the world. And they said, like, what are your greatest headaches? What keeps you up at night? Uh, and they put together this great CEO report that's available on their websites, both, uh, both the consulting company and um, on Said Oxford's website. And the, the thing that they found that was consistent against the, across these CEOs was their sense of, I'm dealing with these competing demands and I can't make a choice between them. And so whether Mm -hmm. it's, you know, this sense of am I global or am I local or today and tomorrow, or whether it's as a leader, am I more transparent or am I more reserved? Am I more sort of dictatorial and assertive or am I more collaborative? You know, these kind of tensions keep coming up. Short term or long term? That's another Short term or long term? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the question is not short term or long term. It's how can we, you know, do both. How can we create uh, value in the short term, but also be really long term and sustainable in the long term? This is a wonderful, wonderful message to take away from our conversation. Um, how can you do both? And we had a previous guest on the podcast, Fons Trompenas. I don't know if you are aware of him or if you know him. And he did some interesting uh, work uh, around culture and he talks about similar issues. And actually, he probably even takes it a step further and he says it doesn't even have to be um, this and that, but it can be this through that sometimes. That's right. So actually, yes, I know Fonzie has yeah. wonderful work with Charles Hamden Turner, uh, yeah. and the two of them are have just been. Charles Hamden Turner has been thinking about this for such a long period of time. We, he was one of the early heroes that I had uh, really, mm. you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. And indeed, mm. you know, 
uh, in some ways, the easiest way to think about paradox is, you know, how do we move from A or B to A and B? The more complex mm -hmm. argument is to say, how is it that A informs B and B informs A? How is it that the more innovative we are, the more that we can enable our current clients' markets' products, and that the more that we are stable with our current clients' markets' products, we can be more innovative? How is it that our social mission can really enable and support our financial bottom line and, and vice mm. versa? And, you know, we like to use, uh, Paradox World loves to use the yin-yang as a... Um, an image. Yeah. And it's not just the black and the white slivers. It's this kind of dynamic morphing between black and white. There, you know, mm -hmm. there's not just a straight line between them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that they morph into each other. And, you know, for those of your listeners that are just more image oriented, right? It's that morphing, but it's also those dots yeah. in between, right? What's that black within the mm -hmm. white? What does that represent? Um in our in our sort of decision making absolutely yeah i love that beautiful image to finish on you know by the uh, way if we go back to this family and work tension that people are always experiencing in some ways the question could be how is it that the energy that i get from the career decisions that I make help to sustain, train, benefit my family? Mm -hmm. And how is it that focusing on and engaging in the sort of uh, relationships with my family really give me energy for work? So how can I, how, instead of thinking about it as just a time crunch mm -hmm. where it's the zero sum game, one or the other, how can I think about it as creating more abundant resources where energy from one enables energy from the other and I can actually get more done by doing that? Now, it's tricky because there is this time <laughs> crunch, but that's the question to switch to is, is yeah. not this sort of zero sum fixed pie approach, but this sort of abundant expand the pie you know, expand the resources approach. Mm -hmm. So um, since we are talking about abundance, um, I know that there are a few elements and abundance is one of them of that um, paradoxical thinking and mindset um, and moving from um, thinking that we have limited resources to thinking that actually resources can be abundant. Could you tell us um, the, the remaining elements of that mindset? Right. So one of them is just how we think about resources, like you said, mm -hmm. right? Is is it, you know, it's time, it's space, it's money, it's it, that these things feel really constrained and, and fixed pie. It's one or the other. So how do we think about the value of them to expand them? Uh, another is just the simple idea of are there multiple truths in the world? Mm -hmm. So if we assume that there's one truth in the world, and so this is very Western, very Aristotelian, the idea that we are, that there's one truth. And if we're in a conflicting situation, the goal is to, it's just that we don't know the truth. So our goal is to find more sophisticated thinking, more sophisticated tools toward a more specific truth. Mm -hmm. The other approach, which is much more Eastern, much more, is that there's multiple truths that can exist side by side. And how do we accommodate these multiple truths that exist side by side. Mm -hmm. So so that's part of it. And then and this is actually the the most important and perhaps hardest to and by the way, just these this notion of truth is that if there's one truth in the world, you know, you and I can't both be right. Love and hate can't both be right. Yeah. Like today and tomorrow can't both be right. One has to be right. But if there's multiple truths, we don't have to get into that debate. Mm -hmm. But the, the the third is just as a manager, is my role to control, to focus, to confine, or is my role one that enables people to move forward without that sense of control, that, that creates the conditions for people to move forward while living in this ambiguity? So do I have to narrow, focus, and squeeze out the ambiguity, or can I create the conditions for people to effectively live in this ambiguity? And mm -hmm. that's really hard. I mean, this goes right back to what it means to be a leader, the notion of how vulnerable we are as leaders, uh, because it's really vulnerable to tell people, I don't know the specific answer, or this will emerge over time, or what have you, as opposed to, you know, here's where we're going, let's go. 
Correct. And, you know, it's, it's amazing because what then you look at those amazing leaders. I recently interviewed Gary Rich, uh, who's the president and the CEO of um, WD40, an iconic organization, um, an iconic product, I think, particularly in the US and in Canada. Yeah. And he said the three most important words that he learned is his, in his career and was difficult to say them was, I don't right. know. Right. Right. You know, when I teach leadership, I say the one thing that I hope you get out of this, and this is at the MBA level, at the executive level, is leadership is about vulnerability. And mm. that's really, really, I mean, this is where leadership is not a textbook uh, learning. It's mm. about living in that uncertainty and that vulnerability. We, um, yeah. we did some uh, work interviewing Paul Pullman. So Paul Pullman's the CEO of uh, Unilever and um, as some of your particularly European listeners might know, right, Unilever is the large packaging company, right? So they've got ice creams like Wall ice cream and Ben and Jerry's ice cream, and they have Dove soap and Axe shampoo. And Paul Pullman set out a very uh, progressive sustainability plan that has to do with reducing their carbon footprint, that has to do with creating new uh, innovation to be able to to um, provide products to the bottom of the pyramid to improve mm -hmm. their health and well-being. And when his managers come to him and say, you know, Paul, this is nice and good, but do you want me to manufacture in a cost-effective way or do you want me to manufacture in an environmentally sustainable mm -hmm. way? His answer is yes, yes. Right? <laughs> and yes, so that both. probably drives them absolutely crazy, but it forces them to really drill down to, okay, well, now we've raised the question. Yes. How do we do both? Let's develop new processes and practices to think about that. I think that now we can move to the quick fire questions, which is a series of five questions that I ask all our guests in rapid succession. And we'll aim um, at answering them in under two minutes. You got it. Okay, <laughs> great. So how do you define organizational culture? Yes. So I think culture are the features, uh, the, the social unwritten rules that guide people to behave the way that they do in a communal way. And what are the signs that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? That the people inside the organization are feeling a sense of disconnection from one another and are feeling frustrated in a way that they cannot push forward. Are there any companies that you admire for their culture? And if yes, why? I do. So earlier I said that we had done some work with uh, Unilever and Paul Pullman. And again, it's his ability to really put on the agenda that Fortune 500 companies can be sustainably uh, have impact, be sustainable, and really acknowledge that that's hard and work through what's so hard mm -hmm. about that. What books on culture or leadership would you recommend? So one of the early influences for me was a book by Kenwin Smith and David Berg called Paradoxes of Group Life. Mm. And that really made salient for me the notion and the challenges of these tensions. It was a book from the 1980s that I really love. Mm -hmm. The other thing that the other um, author that really influenced me was a woman um, from the turn of the century, Mary Parker Follett. And I think as a real giant of organizational thought, she sometimes gets left behind. And she was the one working on real challenges around conflict in organizations and helping people to think about what it means to develop a more integrative approach when it talked to labor and managers, when it talked about labor and managers or what have you. And her ideas about how do we get to an and solution are so uh, ahead of their time and really worth going back to at this time. Wonderful. And I haven't read any of, of the two books that you've mentioned, so I'm looking forward to um, digging into them. And we'll post the links in the show notes for our listeners to find these books as well. So finally, um, what is one thing that our listeners can do tomorrow to build their own culture lab and start cultivating a culture that will help them and their team to bring their vision to life? It's a great question. So again, our conversation here has been focused around a both and culture, a paradoxical culture. And again, I often say when I'm doing a workshop that if there's one thing you can do, it's change the question. 
And so again, if leaders think about the questions that they ask, that will inform what kinds of things people will be looking for as they answer those questions. In a both mm -hmm. and context, I think it's changing the question to the both and question. But mm -hmm. just shifting what we ask will elicit very different kinds of thinking and behavior on the part of our employees. So I would focus on that. Love it. So finally, I wanted to ask, do you have anyone to recommend as the next guest on the podcast? We're looking for people who have been successful in consciously and intentionally cultivating cultures or people who have interesting things to say about leadership or culture, um, perhaps researchers or thought leaders in that area. Any suggestions, Wendy? Yeah, so I would be... I would reach out to Jeremy Hockenstein, who leads Digital Divide Data. I think when he started this social enterprise, it was uh, he, he was a real pioneer. And how he navigated these tensions was really uh, challenging, and he did it beautifully. And so I think he is a great example of creating this, this kind of a culture inside of an organization mm -hmm. um, as, as one individual to explore and, and think yeah. about. Wonderful. Could you put us in touch with him? Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So finally, I wanted to ask if you'd like to leave our listeners with um, some final words. Um, and, and also, if you could let the audience know how they could get in touch with you or where they can learn more about your work. Absolutely. Well, first of all, Aga, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. This conversation has been really energizing and generative. So, so thanks for engaging with this. And thank you to your listeners for engaging in this conversation. Um, Maybe I will uh, just end with, you know, I started out with saying that for me, my story started as uh, one of, do I go into practice? Do I go into academia? Do I focus on innovation? Do I focus on social responsibility? And in some ways, uh, looking back at that debate, um, you know, it was really my own very strong either or that led me to thinking about, well, well, what does it look like to live in a both and world? And so, uh, so I really, um, you know, they say that academics stand in their blind spots um, and start to research from their own pain points. So um, I, uh, uh -huh. I empathize with just how easy it is to get stuck in that either or, um, and really value the work of so many mentors who have helped me think through what it means to live in a both and. Um, and in some ways, uh, you know, if there is a, a, a bit of a silver lining, it's that we're all in this together. And so we can all support one another in this together. So I would be pleased to connect with your listeners. Mm -hmm. um, they can find me on Twitter. Uh, it's at prof. P-R-O-F, Wendy Smith. Uh, they can find me at the University of Delaware at smithw at udel.edu. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to connect. Wonderful. Wendy, thank you so much. It was a really stimulating conversation about a difficult topic, but I think that you've been really great in helping us understand and making it simple um, so that our listeners can start experimenting with it because I think we need to start doing something about those things. It's not enough to understand it, um, but also we need to start actually e experimenting with it and exploring, as you say, what it feels like to live this both and life. Um, um, and I'm sure that we're all um, up for interesting experiences when we do that. Absolutely. So thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you, Wendy Smith, for this amazing interview. And thank you for listening. Thank you to our sound producer, James Eid of Be Heard, our production manager, Lindsay Nunes, content editor, Rachel Lies and art director, Emily Spencer. Also, thank you, Elise Martin, for your review on iTunes. Elise said, great podcast, great guests, great vibe. Keep up the awesome work. Culture is everything and we can't wait for the next episode. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you haven't already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes. It really helps people like you to discover it and enables us to fulfill our mission to demystify organizational culture and to help people in companies to create a culture that brings their vision to life. And before we go, I 
have really, really exciting news. My next guest is someone who has been on my dream guest list for a while alongside people like Michelle Obama, Brené Brown, Sheryl Sandberg, Oprah Winfrey. Yes, why not? Sarah Blakely, Richard Branson, Seth Godin, it's a long list. Um, so who is it? Who is it next time? The one and only Patty McCord, the woman behind the famous Netflix culture deck and someone who has really disrupted HR and who continuously challenges the way we think about HR and what we do around culture and with our people. Have a listen to this delicious preview of our conversation due for release as always in two weeks from now. Bye for now. I remember coaching a, a company that was worried because they had grown so big, their customer service people couldn't be in corporate headquarters. And they had had a Christmas, it was a retail company, they had had a Christmas where the customer service people worked six days a week, 12 hours a day, and they were really resentful that other people didn't. And the, the very junior HR person said, I went over there and I told them this will never happen again. And I said, what Christmas? <laughs> you just took Christmas away from people. <laughs> like, of course, it's going to happen again. You're a seasonal business with a gift. <laughs> I mean, you know, so you so you just told them a big fat lie. Right. You're not going to make it easier for them. They're going to work hard at Christmas and other people aren't because their part is done. And now it's time for the, but I said, they're like, Oh, well, I should send the CEO over to talk to them and make them feel better. I'm like, uh, uh, send the CFO to explain to them how the business works and talk to them about your cost per customer acquisition and marketing. And, and I think in your company, it's $22 per person, right? That's what it, it's total marketing cost to acquire a new customer. And what you want to tell those customer service reps is not, oh, I feel so bad that you have to talk to cranky customers all day. You want to tell them that whenever a customer hangs up and says, wow, that was great service. I'm going to tell my mom to use this company. You just put $22 on the bottom line. Thank you for listening to this episode of Culture Lab. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share it with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. 